I always had a fascination for Karu, which stems from childhood, I suppose. When I ventured into Newstead Derby and saw the pencil drawing of her, it wasn't just that. There was something more, something which haunted one. She breathed her last on the 26th of January, 1828. She lay silent and motionless, as though staring at a vision from her past. Her bedroom at Brockett had been a shrine containing an altar cloth, a crucifix, and a portrait of Lord Byron. Mrs. George Lamb, her husband's sister, who had been her friend and playmate in the halcyon days of Devonshire House, held her frail, thin hand as the scarcely audible breathing faded away. Then there came a long, long sigh from her still lips. It was over. Caro was at peace. She died without any pain and from complete exhaustion. That was according to the doctors who crowded around her lifeless form. Her husband, William, hid his emotions when they called him into the room. He just gazed down at the bed. Tranquility, so alien to Caroline's nature, had swept over the sad figure, and he barely recognized her. It was rumoured that an obituary notice in the London Gazette, which touched on Cairo's connection with Lord Byron, was written by her husband. It felt that she must be dealt with leniently. 
No one had less malevolence in all her errors. She hurt only herself. And against herself only were leveled her accusations. The obituary observed the world is very lenient to the mistresses of poets, and perhaps not without justice. For their attachments have something of excuse. Not only in their object, but in their origin, they arise from imagination, not depravity. There are many yet living who drew from the opening years of this gifted and warm-hearted being hopes which her maturity was not fated to realize. Lady Morgan entered the following in her diary at the time of Caro's death. She was tall and slight in her figure. Her countenance was grave, her eyes dark, large and bright, her complexion fair, her voice soft, low, caressing, that was at once a beauty and a charm, and worked much of that fascination that was peculiarly hers. It softened down her enemies the moment they listened to her. She was eloquent, most eloquent, full of ideas, and all graceful, gracious expression. But her subject was always herself. She confounded her dearest friends and direst foes, for her feelings were all impulses worked on by a powerful imagination, all elements of great eloquence, but not good for guidance. One of her great charms was the rapid transition of manner, which changed its theme. The chief cause of the odd things which she used to say and do was that never having lived out the habits of her own class, yet sometimes mixing with people of inferior rank, notably only by their genius, she constantly applied her own sumptuous habits to them. Caroline was interred in the Lamb family vault, which now lies forgotten in the catacombs below St. Ethelred's church at Hatfield. If I whisper that address, it's because I want to afford her a continuance of peace. But it is not too many miles from Brockedor. I would visit those catacombs. I would find Caro's coffin, as close to her as I would be years later to the actress who played her, in a most excellent if somewhat incomplete film, released in 1972. I thought I'd be overwhelmed meeting the actress, Sarah Miles. I was not. I remember my actress friend, Catherine Hall, saying how she played Caro was the minimum, at least that, at least. We were on a pilgrimage in the 70s to Eustace Abbey and there was much Carolineish about Catherine Hall, to say the least. I'd agree with her that Sarah Miles played her more or less to perfection. The tumult, the ardour, the romance which bewildered her reason and clouded her understanding. It could be Sarah Miles we're talking about. It's 
such as it was, my connection to the actress that played Kara was somewhat thwarted by her manager, at least I believe him to be. But Sarah's portrayal of Kara was more or less exactly as I imagined the original to be. And for that I was grateful. Caro recollected Lord Byron's promise and vow to her, written in the distant, also distant past. No other in word or deed shall ever hold the place in my affection, which is and shall be most sacred to you. I am nothing. As the romantic age itself began to decline, Caro and Byron were nothing other than the stuff of future memory. Yet, yet they seem restless in our midst. Their unearthly presence can be felt. They haunt us still. It was not in my mind to return to Brockett Hall and the room which had denied me access. The same room that Caroline had turned into a shrine to Lord Byron. It would seem that time was effacing memory of the room itself. Lord Brockett married in the year following my first visit, and his wife, a very charming and attractive lady from America, could not identify the room, the room I sought, due to conversations having taken place at the house. She was apologetic, most apologetic, being unable to assist the discovery of Caro's bedroom. But having explained that Lord Brockett is a great non-believer, went on to recount several uncanny experiences which had occurred at the hall since her arrival. Lady Brockett told me, I did see a woman in the ballroom some years ago when I was playing the piano. Chopin on both occasions. The chandelier started wobbling and there, there was no one else in the house. I saw the woman from the corner of my eye. She was in a pale, long dress, but when I turned around, she was gone. An echo of Caroline was being glimpsed and heard in the place she loved most of all, and it was heartening to learn that the music of Chopin, which I too have played and loved since childhood, induced a responsive atmosphere. But I would end my pilgrimage where I had begun, at nearby St. Ethelreda's Church. I knelt at the altar, which is in close proximity to where Caro's body has reposed in the catacombs for a great many years. The early mist had started to clear upon my arrival, but the gloom in the dim interior of that sanctuary was all-pervading. I cannot say how long I remained. The hours just drifted away, meditating upon her tragic life, silently praying for herself. For in such places can sometimes be achieved a certain state of mind. 
which is out of time. Poor Caro. I heard the words exhale from my lips in a deep, long sigh. I had looked upon her sad remains in that dank place where her coffin reposed and was more enchanted by that than the person who would play her years before. My muse was suddenly interrupted by a shaft of sunlight piercing a nearby stained glass window. It struck the very flagstone beneath which lay Caro's sad remains. Yet more astonishing was the simultaneous tinkling sound in the distance, like the angelic notes of a harpsichord wafting on the wind from afar. Whether the source was neighbouring Brockett or somewhere more celestial did not seem to matter in that moment. For my heart told me that Caro was responding in her own inimitable way and the melancholy evoked by my surroundings was suddenly washed away. The world that she inhabited grows ever distant, and with it recedes lingering echoes in the footfalls of one who pursued the images of high romance and impossible love. I understood her all too well, as I understand my ancestor by blood. The creature she obsessed over, the poet, perhaps England's greatest poet, Lord Byron. I heard myself uttering as I left that place. Fare thee well, Caro.